Welcome back to the Money Show here on Arise News. For a greater perspective on Nigeria and the Sustainable Development Goals, we are now linking up with our Rice Abuja studio to spend some time on the subject of the SDGs with Professor Ebere Umudiwe, political scientist and economist, currently a distinguished fellow at the Center for Democracy and Development, Abuja. Professor Umudiwe has served as a member of the governing council of the Benedian University of Kada, Edo State, as well as member of board of the Ujuku Center, Uweri Imu State. He recently served in the office of the advisor on economic matters to the president of Nigeria. Professor Umudiwe, welcome to the morning show. Thank you very much, Prof. Ruben. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Good to see you. Now, Prof, um, you know, let's take a look at uh, Nigeria's uh, performance with regard to the implementation of the 17 Sustainable uh, Development uh, Goals. I know you publish uh, a journal titled SDG, SDG Monitor, uh, Journal of uh, Implementation. And the Nigerian government has consistently promised that it will implement the 17 goals uh, faithfully. And even at this... Uh, uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly. There was a special event uh, attended by uh, President Buhari and many of the uh, governors of the various states. So on the surface of it, you see a lot of uh, enthusiasm and uh, commitment. But what's your assessment of the uh, level of uh, achievement in concrete terms uh, in Nigeria, both the federal and state levels? Well, thank you very much. Uh, in my view, that's a lot of effort, as you've just reflected, that is being made at various levels of government towards the implementation of SDGs. But these efforts have not actually provided a result that can make one claim that there is real achievement in this effort to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And a lot of the reasons include uh, inadequate financing by government and uh, the usual problem that we associate with events in Nigeria, including discontinuity of efforts and corruption, of course. But in some areas, a lot of uh, good efforts have been registered, especially uh, in some aspects of the targets uh, that deal with uh, poverty alleviation. So I think in this area, the government's institution of uh, the SIP, the institution that is being headed by Barrister Wes is one example of a positive effort towards the achievement of an SDG target. And I think we should give credit to that one. Well, it's good to hear you give credit regarding goal one, but what about the other 16 goals? How far along are we? with regards to attaining those goals? Well, you know, the, it is a little too ambitious, in my view, to expect achievement of the 17 goals at the same time. I think we should use the 17 goals as a guide to development. And we now make our priority list out of the 17 goals in a way that takes into consideration our own resource constraints and our own unique needs. We as a country recently has been ranked as the home for the concentration of the extreme poor. So poverty should be a priority for us. You know, and looking at the issue of poverty, we should be quite holistic and have it considered in the context of our development programs. We are a country that have 
that has uh, ignored uh, development planning. And this has hurt us in many, many ways. I think that uh, it is very possible for us to zero in in this issue of eliminating extreme poverty in Nigeria, if not all dimensions of poverty as a whole. And in doing so, we must come to a mindset that puts people first. And that means we must bring ourselves to think of development in terms of basic needs. I think recently uh, the Emir of Kano uh, was uh, put, uh, was uh, asked by the United Nations to be part of the spokespersons for, uh, of, of, the, of the advocacy for SDGs. And I think he is a man who uh, believes in this principle of basic needs. And I think that that, uh, that aspect of, uh, of uh, pursuing, uh, of, of following poverty issues in a way that will bring succor to the millions of Nigerians that are suffering under uh, poverty every, every, every year. Uh, it is it's very well taken. Well, Prof, it, uh, I mean, I listened to you earlier on. You were commending the uh, social investment uh, program uh, when you referred to uh, uh, yeah. Miriam Ways. Uh, but, I mean, if you look at, uh, yeah. you know, what has happened in Nigeria, virtually every government has tried to introduce measures to address the challenge of poverty, uh, you know. But at the end of the day, we don't see much in terms of impact. And even, uh, you know, persons have, there are persons who have criticized some of the programs of the present administration. The SIP, uh, Social Investment Program, the uh, School Feeding Program, uh, Trader Money, uh, the Economic Empowerment Program, and all of that. And Nigeria, you know, still remains, uh, you know, uh, on the world poverty clock. Uh, the uh, country with, with the, uh, you know, with the, the poorest country in the world, with the highest number of the poor. Uh, but this is, the question I want to ask you is, look, if you disaggregate the poverty situation in Nigeria, where should we place more emphasis? Is it rural areas or urban areas? Is it targeting women or children? Or should it be uh, the northern part of the country or the middle belt or the, uh, or the uh, southern part of the country? What does the research, what does it tell us? Well, our research shows us the concentration of poverty more in the north than in the south or even the general area of the middle belt. So that's what research says. But uh, what I believe is that we should uh, be discriminatory in our application of any solutions because uh, Nigeria is not homogeneous in different areas of development, say education uh, or poverty, those areas that we have to concentrate on, uh, it's, it's not a uniform situation across the country. Uh, for instance, uh, if we want to concentrate our resources in taking care of our education, we must know that there are parts of Nigerians whose education level equal those that can be competi uh, competitive at the, national, uh, at the international level. And there are parts that are very, very low. So we cannot use uh, a sort of one shoe fits all approach. So, but I, I agree with you that we have had an array of, um, of, um, of, de of uh, development approaches uh, in, in, the, uh, in the particular issue of uh, alleviating poverty, and that none of them has come to much. Uh, and they, they, we have to find out why is that so. A lot of our problems is lack of long-term thinking. And I believe that if we uh, approach these poverty issues from uh, the, unique the unique situation of Nigeria, 
we, we can go very far to, av to avoid some of those problems that you have outlined. And I think those problems come, as I said before, uh, they come from discontinuity of policy, they come from limited efforts at implementation, proper implementation, they are all victims of corruption, and so we have to find a way to uh, design a policy that is in the long term interest of the poor. Uh, uh, since, since we know that uh, corruption, for instance, is something that permeates all levels of policy implementation in this country. So can we find a way of uh, reaching the poor with resources that would not go through the intermediaries of government uh, at, at state levels or at, uh, or at uh, uh, local government levels. I believe personally that direct taxable revenue sharing that goes directly to Nigerian poor is the best way to go. We can give these monies instead of the monies passing through the states or passing through the local government or in the rural areas where most of our people, or most of our poor reside, we can design a way to get the money directly to, to the individuals. This is quite doable, and it is done, done in so many other countries. A problem with us in implementing this kind of policy is that we don't have a proper census. We don't know how many Nigerians are there. And we don't know how many Nigerians are resident in different parts of the country. And now this has been complicated by the recent claim of a, a former, of a governor of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a is it Plateau State? Uh, uh, not Plateau State, a governor of Bauchi State that claims that, uh, uh, that every West African is a Nigerian. Bauchi State, sir. So uh, what I that guess my Bauchi point State, is... That um, was Bauchi State, the governor of Allah Mohammed there. I want to ask you if there are any model countries that you can point to that are well on the way to implementing the SDGs. And also, as we're taking a look back, as Dr. Abati was saying, about what previous administrations have done with regards to alleviation or eradication of poverty, let's also take a look back at Nigeria's performance with regards to the Millennium Development Goals. What are the lessons that we can learn from that? Nigeria did not achieve the Millennium Development Goals either. And uh, the current SDG goes, but it had a lot of experience. It had a lot of experience. And, um, and it is not without, uh, it is not for lack of, uh, uh, of uh, manpower to achieve it. It was mostly, again, a problem of the ills that I have already outlined. Uh, because after all, the lady that led uh, that uh, Millennium Development Goals is none other than Amina Mohammed, who is uh, in the United Nations now as Deputy Secretary General, and who has done, a, who, who put a lot of effort in developing SDGs. But the point I was making is that we can bypass governmental institutions to give the money from our resource rent directly to Nigerians rather than through governments. And the reason why we have to do this is that, number one, it will bring the recipients of these monies into the formal economy. Because a lot of these people are in the informal economy, and they are scattered all over the country, and they are more resident in the rural areas than in the townships. And we can share these monies directly to them, and this would be a taxable revenue sharing model. And it's already being done in one of the American states, the state of Alaska, has been doing it for years. And they had to share royalty checks to all citizens of that uh, state. So if we can send money directly to people and tax them in the process, for instance, if in a local government area, and this is just an example, you have uh, 100 people. And for these 100 people, we are sending 20,000 uh, naira 
uh, every month. So instead of the states and local governments rushing to, uh, or states in particular rushing to Abuja to come and share uh, at the end of the month, you send direct checks to their citizens. Now, suppose then you go to have these 200 uh, people sharing the, uh, the, the, the uh, you have the 20,000 Naira being shared by this number of people. Suppose each person now gets 200, 200 Naira every month. And then, but the check he will receive will only have 100 Naira because you will explain that he has paid tax to the state for 80 and has paid his, uh, 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 to federal government, whatever level, so that you take a total tax of 100 naira out of the 200. He knows that his money, that the tax money, is now the 100 dollars, 100 naira taken from him, is now at this level of government, or at the local government, state government, or at the national government. He will be more, much more forceful in making sure that that money that was taken from, his, from him is used for good purposes that he will see. Because right now, the money that goes, that, that when, the, when you tell him that the federal, that the federal or national or, or state or local government have abused the money that was sent in his name, he doesn't relate to it because that's like a pie in the sky. But if the money passes through his hands first before it becomes because it becomes government property in form of tax, he will make sure, he will make sure that corruption does not exist with his money because the money that's stealing will be his own, no longer money coming from thin air. So that, that's one, another advantage. The next advantage is that the federal government or whichever institution he sets up to do this can now force that person to save. Say, so, well, out of this year, 100, look, if you let us save 20 naira, if you let us save 20 naira, put it in savings in your name, uh, then at this period of time, we will match it. The federal government will match it by two, three, or four factors. This is an incentive for saving. So what this does is that it helps the poor to build up an asset. It, builds, it makes him an owner of the country as well. He builds up an asset, and this asset is what is going to be useful in the consideration of government, which the CBN and the rest of them are doing now, in bringing in, in what they call financial inclusion. How can we extend banking services, savings, credits, insurance, and all of that to the poor of Nigeria? And we don't do that because these people are not bankable. We see them that way now. But as a way, we can make them bankable. So these are two areas, I think, that we, uh, are areas I think that we should consider as a, as a unique way of looking at the issue of uh, poverty under the SDGs program. Yeah. It's a long-term thing that we can do, but I think it's a very useful one. Uh, Prof, we've spent quite some time on uh, uh, SDG goal number one, on uh, zero poverty. But let's look at another goal, I think uh, goal number five, on gender equality, which is something uh, that is very important also to Nigeria. Um, in the la during the last uh, general elections in Nigeria, the political parties were talking about women empowerment. A lot of women uh, took part in the uh, election, hoping that, look, women representation in uh, public life would uh, improve. But we have not seen much progress in, in that regard. Uh, the average Nigerian woman remains uh, almost uh, like a second-class citizen, if I may use that uh, phrase. What can we do in real terms uh, to further empower Nigerian women and to mainstream them in Nigerian uh, politics and governance? Well, that's a very important point, the issue of gender. And we have actually looked at it in our own uh, situation here, in our journal. And we commissioned a study on, on the gender issue, and we found that your observations are right in order. A lot of the... Uh, talk about gender equality in Nigeria is mostly lip service. And they, they do nothing to implement it in a real way. And, uh, uh, and because the implementation of this will go right into some traditional practices, traditional beliefs. And uh, so that uh, uh, 
the people who are in a position to make decisions that will bring our women. Because look, it, the, 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 the women population of Nigeria, uh, or, the, or, or the female population of Nigeria is very, very high. And they are all able to attain the levels of skills that the men have attained. So that by keeping them away from our, our development efforts, by discriminating against our women, we are in many ways retarding our national development. It is the same kind of uh, lack of understanding that is driving uh, these uh, people who put tradition before development. Now, I have no little respect for tradition. I love tradition, and it has to be respected. But if the tradition is killing our development, I think we should look at that aspect of that tradition twice. So that we, uh, tradition that does not allow us to extend education to our women, that's killing development. Tradition that does not allow us to uh, do uh, things that improve the health of uh, our mothers uh, and, and, and bearers of our children, these traditions need to be gotten rid of. And so any government that is very serious about development must know that your women are equal partners in that process and that if you are not including the women, you are only fighting with 50% of your abilities. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. I'd like to take goal 6 and 13 together. Goal 6 is clean water and sanitation. Goal 13 relates to climate action. What do we say to these two goals and our progress in achieving them when we have Nigeria as the world's capital for open defecation and we have Port Harcourt blanketed in black soot and more delays with the Ogoni cleanup? I think where we are is always, in all, all the goals, very heavy on intentions, on good intentions, than on action and implementation. Implementation has always been the problem of every aspect of policy making in Nigeria. The ideas are many, but doing is the problem. So the, uh, the, the issue of uh, uh, health is implied in all the two goals that you have just mentioned. And, and uh, as you know, if you don't have a healthy population, you are not going to be able to develop for real. I, I will come back to that in a minute. But uh, I think it was very good intention of the government to clean Ogoni. Because I think the biggest travesty in this country is the flaring, one of the biggest travesties, there are so many of them, of course, is the flaring of gases in Ogoni that ruins the health of these people who are sitting on the source of wealth for this country. And the government, until this one, has not taken uh, any serious actions in cleaning the debt that is ruining the health of these Nigerians uh, uh, that, that, that live in the Niger Delta. And not just the Niger Delta, but it's creeping uh, the poison from this flaring and, and the debt that is surrounding uh, the immediate areas of, of drilling for oil it's, um, has, has some externalities that will affect other Nigerians as well. So, so I think they have not done much, period, uh, in, 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 in both general cleanliness, the defecation that you mentioned is a source of shame, much like many other things that um, our country uh, uh, is, is dealing, is confronted with. But you see, I think that this country must come to a point of seriousness in tackling its legions of problems. And the way to start is to start looking at Nigerian problems as Nigerian problems and not confront them from regional or ethnic uh, standpoints of bias. 
Because look, if you now look at, if you are in power and you look at Niger Delta and you see that this is a part of your country and that it's killing your citizens, the, 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 uh, the source of your major income, uh, you should do something about it. And I think this, this, uh, they have started already with this administration in tackling that problem, which many other administrations failed to do. But also the issue of desertification, which comes to the larger question of, uh, of, of climate that you, that you talk about. The flaring, of course, contributes to, 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 uh, to, to destruction of our climate which every humanity is, um, every member of humanity is, uh, is a victim of. But desertification is confronting us in the face. And it is uh, generating some of the problems that uh, has translated themselves into, into civic problems, into, into, uh, uh, into the community clashes that we see. So uh, taking that, not we don't have to be told to follow the Paris uh, Agreement. This is actually confronting us as we speak, as a people, and it's destroying unity, it's destroying the country as we speak, so that um, tackling it should be part of our priority. But as I say, if our country wants to show some seriousness in all aspects of SDGs implementation, First of all, it has to start planning with numbers, with facts. And you can't plan unless you know how many Nigerians there are. We don't know how many Nigerians there are, and we can't plan. There is a book written called Planning Without Facts so many years ago uh, about Nigeria. It was written by Stopler. Stopler was one of those people who came to advise Pius Okibo, our great economist, when he uh, wrote uh, the development plans for Nigeria at the beginning of our independence, uh, at the beginning periods of our independence. Uh, so, look, when Pius died, uh, he, he, he was, uh, celeb he was um, um, there was an occasion where everybody was invited to Northwestern University where he was the first uh, 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 black African to get a PhD in economics. So we went there to celebrate him and we produced a book about this. But Mr. Stopler, who was then about 82 years old, came to that event. And, uh, and he's the one who wrote that book on Nigeria, on how Nigeria planned without facts. We are still planning without facts. Isn't this a shame? After so many years of independence, we still have not been able to count this country. Everything is still politicized. Even when it comes to facts that you need to plan your development, you can't do a proper census. A country of over 50 years old is not able to know how many people it has. And with people still politicizing it as we speak, even people in high places. It's a bloody shame. Well, so I mean, you are primarily uh, a teacher and a researcher. Uh, you've taught in universities uh, around the world, and now you are back home. Um, quality education is one of the uh, goals, uh, one of the SDG goals. Um, when you look around Nigeria, from what you have seen, where are we with regard to uh, quality education, with particular regard to youth literacy? Well, you know, uh, uh, our investment in education is below what is required. Everybody knows that. And uh, so we have uh, an education system that is suffering pure neglect. It, it is really uh, by grace of God that, our, that Nigerians who go to our schools still remain very competitive when they go abroad. But the quality of education is very, very low because of lack of investment. It is not because we don't have people that will deliver good education to Nigeria, but we need to invest in education. We need to seriously invest in education at a level that will produce uh, good results for our country. Because our people are performing at superior levels all over the world, all over the world. In every academic setting, our people are very, very competitive. And yet, they go through hell to 
go uh, to, to get good to get some education in Nigeria. So the effort is here. The the endowment by God, the ability to 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 read and understand the brain is here. But we are having again government after government that do not pay attention to education, that do not give it its due in budgetary allocations. And even when the budgetary allocations are made in big numbers, the monies are not released enough. So you have students who are suffering from strikes year after year, and they come out without enough skills to get good jobs. And so they roam the streets, they become nuisance, they constitute nuisance in so many ways. They, they, they can't get good jobs because they don't have good skills. And, um, and, and in many cases, the jobs are not there. So really, we are, we are really contributing to the situation that we have on the streets today because the government refuses to pay attention to education. Look, this country, there's the moral principle of what I proposed before about giving money directly to, to every Nigerian. Uh, especially the poor Nigerians, we can start with those because we know the income levels that constitute poverty. So we can start with those. And, and the, the, the moral principle behind that is that the Nigerians are owners of the resources of this country. Whether these resources be diamond or gold or columbite or tin or coal or oil, it belongs to Nigerians. And so why can't we give them money directly? And, uh, and, and, and help them to create the habit of savings in the way I have proposed so that these people will now be brought into the formal economy and where they can be competitive. I and mean, let me tell you something else. This country is a country where the presidents dish out oil wells for favor. They give it to people. They just say, you, this is your oil well, just like that. And yet the people that are suffering uh, every day cannot get some proceeds from this resource uh, rent that the government uh, collects. So I think it's totally an unfair system. The system is totally unfair. And it is this unfairness that is creating the situation of, of distrust and violence in the country. And it is something that the country must take seriously into consideration if Absolutely, it sir. wants to keep the country. Absolutely, sir. Correct on all points. And go that ahead. leads me to goal eight, which is decent work and economic growth. So the idea behind that is full and productive employment for all men and women by 2023. The Minister of Labor and Productivity, um, Senator um, Chris Ngige, has said that Buhari administration can do more. What should they be doing to increase productivity, to really increase our use of technological innovation, boost job creation and entrepreneurship? Well, you know, it's, you see how interwoven the goals are, because they are all very much related to each other, with the question we just left about education. But the, we are now in uh, uh, an economy that is in, in an, a, a global economic system that is driven primarily by innovation. And innovation has at its component education and skills. The global economy of today is not the economy of our fathers. The economy that is driven by knowledge and skill. It's knowledge economy. It's no accident that it's called knowledge economy. So really, uh, we, we, we are doing a study now on this particular uh, SDG goal. And it's coming out in October. And I'll be sure you get, uh, I, I will not speak to it until we get our findings. We have... Uh, uh, we are at the stage of completing um, a study on, um, on this particular issue. But they are all related. Remember, the, the economic models that we have been following uh, in the past have been ones that said we must uh, put a lot of resources in, product, in economic productivity, in, in, in areas that uh, increase uh, productivity in the economy. But you see, in 1976, 
the international labor organization went away from this particular focus because it says that we should pay attention to the individuals that make up communities, to the people. We must follow what they call that time basic needs model, the basic needs model. And this basic needs model means that we must identify the level of income that can allow somebody to live a sustainable life. And you see, it, it, we needed a cutoff. And it is this, uh, at that time, the cutoff was about $1.25. Now I think it's about $1.90. If you don't live at that level and up, then you are totally below extreme poverty. Well, thank you so very our much, Prof. country uh, needs to. Yes. Thank you very much, Prof. That's all we'll be able to take. Uh, and we've uh, enjoyed your insights uh, very much. Thank you. I'm sure we'll invite you again.